guys, welcome to HOB TV. This is episode 17. Like mentioned last week, today we have a special guest on the show. We're super excited for today's show. But if you haven't already, make sure you guys click that subscribe button if this is your first time watching. And for those that have been watching, thank you guys for tuning on in, staying connected with us. Those that are liking the videos, disliking the videos, and those that are commenting, thank you guys very much. I'm gonna pass it over to my boy Steve. He's gonna give Antonio Rosco that proper intro. Let's go. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to episode 17. Now the guy sitting to my left, there's an old saying that goes, home is where our story begins. Well, for the greater part of 14 years, our next guest honed his boxing skills here in this home, this house, the house of boxing, and under the watchful eyes of Carlos Barragan and Carlos Barragan Sr. Since the inception of this very gym, you could find Antonio Orozco spending countless hours plying his trade in the very ring behind us. It was that unrelenting work ethic, along with an unabating fighting style that earned him the nickname Relentless. A staple of the local fight scene here in San Diego early in his career, Orozco would go on to amass a 7-0 professional record when he caught the eye of Hall of Fame manager Frank Espinosa. And in 2010, Orozco signed with the three-time manager of the year and the Espinosa Boxing Club. One year later, in 2011, Espinosa would play an integral part as liaison and Orozco signing a promotional pack with Golden Boy Promotions. He would make his debut with Oscar De La Hoya's promotional outfit in 2011 on the Canelo Alvarez Alfonso Gomez undercard. From that point on, he proved to be a force in the junior welterweight division, registering a record of 28 and one while defeating former world champions Stevie Forbes and Humberto Soto. You might remember him from last September's junior welterweight championship matchup against Jose Ramirez, a match that was a candidate for fight of the year. He was last seen in the ring this past March, defeating the rugged Jose Luis Rodriguez via, via unanimous decision. He's currently ranked as the number two welterweight by BoxRec, as well as ranked in the top 10 in his division by the WBC World Boxing Council. After a stint at the famed Wild Card Boxing Club, the House of Boxing's prodigal son is back to talk to David and I about his future plans, making his HOB TV debut, Antonio Relentless Orozco. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, man. Um, now let's get right to it, Antonio. Um, Antonio Orozco has some breaking news regarding his future, guys. Uh, Tony, I know you're eager to tell our viewers, let them, let them know what it is. And uh, tell us, how did you come to that conclusion, that decision? You know, uh, it was uh, a little bit difficult, but I mean, with the team that I have, you know, with my manager, it's something that we went over. And I think it's time to move up in the weight division. So, you know, 147, I mean, I think it's gonna be fun. So, so we don't anticipate any more struggles with weight? No, nah, we shouldn't, you know, right. uh, and uh, that's one of the main things. I mean, I've been fighting at this weight class, you know, since my professional career began. And, you know, I started when I was 20, 21, hitting 32 already. So I think it's it's the right time. Exactly, I think it's long overdue. I think it's time. Yeah, I think it's time to move up to 147. There's definitely uh, some guys in that weight division where you can make a name for yourself. I mean, possible opponents that uh, come to mind uh, Saddam Ali just fought this Saturday on the Canelo undercard. I see that being a possible uh, opponent. There's also Eddie Gomez, Alexis Rocha, uh, even the guy that beat, beat Saddam Ali, right? So, I mean, are there, are there any names that come to mind that you would want to go for at 147? Well, you know, I think some of the names that you mentioned, you know, would be a perfect starting point. I mean, we, everybody knows, everybody in the boxing world knows, you know, that the 147 category is packed with tremendous uh, fighters. Yep. And, uh, you know, coming into the mix, I mean, I do have a name for myself, you know, but, you know, coming into 147, it's, although it's just seven more pounds, I mean, it's going to make a difference once yeah. we get up there, so. Uh, Antonio, uh, you mentioned the struggles of making weight. Due to the issue you had making weight in the past, you were heavily criticized by boxing writers and fans alike. Do you feel like because of that, you've been misunderstood? And if so, what would you like the people to know about you? No, you know, um, sometimes there's there's one way to do things and it's the right way. Yeah. You know, sometimes I was uh, forcing myself and uh, it wasn't because of the lack of discipline. You know, sometimes the body has a mind of its own, it does what it wants to do. And, uh, you know, like David said, you know, it probably was long overdue. 
but I, you know, I was forcing myself to make 140, and you know, at 147, you know, I, there should be no issues at all whatsoever. So, I mean, it's just gotta be a new, a new chapter, okay. and that's what there is to it. We're gonna hold you to that, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that, that's not all the, the breaking news, right? Um, you're bringing with you a new trainer to the 147 division. Who is that trainer? You know, I think we might be working with uh, Joel Diaz. You know, um, as everybody knows, you know, I was that uh, wild card. And, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I have to give it to Freddie. Very uh, respected trainer, mm -hmm. you know, but, legend. you know, a legend, correct. And, uh, you know, but we all have our fits. You know, the, there's some things that do give, some things that don't. I mean, the, the work there is tremendous. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to learn from Freddie. And there's some things that I am bringing with me, but uh, you know, I just didn't feel the, the fit there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I just wanted to give myself that opportunity also. You know, I, this is my career, this is what I make a living from. And just to give myself those opportunities to be with trainers, you know, that have been in the game for so long and just to take something with me, I mean, I think that like I could, I deserve that. <laughs> um, well, Jose, Jose Ramirez, uh, he left the wild card last year, you know. And he kind of insinuated that maybe Roach didn't have enough time for him, you know. But as you say, you know, we all, you know, everybody has their fits. And I think Joel Diaz would be a great fit for you. I mean, props to him for yeah. his role in the Francisco Vargas fight this past weekend. Exactly. And recognizing the beating, you know, that Francisco Vargas was taking yeah. and stopping that fight, right? Yeah. Exactly. Saved him for another another payday. Yeah. Right. You know, Joel Diaz, he did a great job with Tim Bradley at 147, man. Exactly. He, you know, got wins over Manny Pacquiao and Juan Manuel Marquez. So I think it'd be a great fit. The boys and girls club over there over in India. In India huh? yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, so you said weight issues, right? Do you yeah. see, did you feel that that was part of the effect maybe at 140, maybe with Ramirez, do you feel like that had an effect on you and your performance making the weight? Because a lot of people don't know like, oh man, he's not making 140 and then you fight. And sometimes that kind of affects you with your performance. Do you feel like it did with you? No, well, you know, um, that that night, I mean, I gave everything I had. You know, of course. People would think that, oh, I walked out empty-handed, but I didn't, you know. I walked out with respect from a lot of boxing fans, trainers sure. and everything. And uh, to answer your question, I mean, I I can't put that up as an excuse. You know, yeah. I, I said I would take that fight at 140. It was my title shot. And I did, you know, I gave everything I had. Um, I felt strong. Um, I had my moments in the fight. Exactly. You know, I just gotta say that night, he was a better fighter. And, uh, you know, I, I came in underweight. Yeah, <laughs> so, right, right. I mean, that, that should say something. Exactly. Uh, you know, but, but no, you know, that, that entire training camp, you know, I was getting the best work that I could. And, uh, I mean, the, he was better that night and uh, I'll props to him. Man. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, you know, we literally found out today about your two big news items that you just shared with us. And, uh, you know, automatically a wish list of opponents for your first opponent at 147 popped into my head. David mentioned some of his names that he would like to see you fight. Uh, some names that I would like to see you, man, is, is John Molina, Josecito Lopez, Omar Figueroa, and Adrian Broner. Um, now, let's compare lists. We compared your list. Uh, well, <laughs> do any of those names kind of... And what's your appetite for for a fight at 147? No, I mean the, these are all great names. I mean, from the list that you guys put up, I mean these are all fighters that like to make exciting fights, you know, and that's my style. So I mean, of course, you know, welcome in any fight like this to give the fans what they're what they're looking for, you know, exciting fights, you know, fights that give something to talk about, and that has been my style since I began my career. So I mean, welcome in any fights at 47. You know, I guess you could say, you know. You know, start off then. I mean, they sound great. Yeah. Now, uh, before we leave the 140 division conversation, uh, we want to get your thoughts on two guys that you're familiar with. Uh, and you're now former division of 140, Maurice Hooker, someone you've sparred with many times in this ring behind us. And Jose Ramirez, as, as we mentioned, you fought last year. They're in talks to me in a unification bout to take place on the zone. What are your thoughts on that bout, and, and who would you favor in that matchup? You know, it's a great fight, you know, yeah. for, for starters. I mean, these are both guys that, as we saw, you know, Hooker defend his title against Alcelo. You know, he came back from a knockdown. Um, Ramirez, obviously, we know he's a busy fighter. And uh, I would say this would be like a 50-50 fight. You know, both, both guys bring a lot to the table or to the ring, I should say. And, uh, I mean, whether the fight gets made, I mean, it's, 
I think it will be made. You know, it's a great unification battle for both fighters. And for sure, it's gonna be there's gonna be some fireworks in there. Oh yeah, definitely. Now, possible now that we're kind of stepping away from the 140, 147. Are there any opponents with? Because I know Matchroom, right? Matchroom has some some fighters at 147. Uh, there's Kel Brook, like you mentioned earlier, Steve. Yeah. There was Kel Brook. Uh, do you see yourself fighting any of those guys? I mean, I mean that's that's the goal, right? I mean, it's this is what I'm here for. Exactly. You know to. You know, just continue my career, you know, just, but obviously make it a little bit more easier on myself, yeah, right? Uh, so, I mean, it's it's going to be not a prolonged process, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's going to be some adjustments that are going to have to be made. And, uh, I mean, we just, I can't take too long, yeah. you know, that I'm not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. No, no, do we have like a time set timetable for, for your debut at Welterweight? Uh, do you know... Table? Looking back in the summer, for sure, okay. you know, uh, like you said, I, like you mentioned, I fought in March. I'm definitely looking back to get back into training camp ready and uh, see what options are going to be laid out. And, uh, you know, just get into the ring at 147 and feel the difference. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now, we talked about your future. Let's revisit your past. Um, a native of Kansas, your, uh, your boxing career started at the Garden City Boxing Club where you were a student of the late Buck Avila. Talk about your experiences there and crossing paths with the likes of Brandon Rios and Victor Ortiz out there. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, I think everybody's kind of heard this story a lot, but, you know, I never get tired of talking about it because, you know, this is where everything began for me. And, uh, yeah, you know, Ignacio Avila, Bucky, you know, and introduced me to the sport of boxing. Um, and that's exactly where I met Brandon and Victor. You know, uh, we pretty much grew up together, you know, went to the same schools, as you could say. And, uh, you know, just knowing that there's so much talent coming from Garden City, you know. I mean, we were the first ones to come out, and now I'm pretty sure everybody's heard of the Acevedo brothers. Yeah. You know, Herbert, Richard. Um, and there's a lot more talent coming. You know, there's a, there's a lot of inspiration out there. So, and just being part of that, you know, it just, I mean gives me something to fight for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So talk with us, talk a little bit with us about your move to San Diego. How was that, having to leave your family and come here to San Diego to chase that, that boxing dream? Uh, well, what a lot of people kind of get misunderstood is I'm originally from California. You know, I was born in LA, um, lived for a while in Tecate, which is like 45 minutes from San Diego. Uh, and moved out to Garden City, Kansas at the age of 10. Um, when I started boxing, you know, every summer I would spend my vacation here in San Diego and LA area. And uh, I just thought that there was a lot more opportunity out here. You know, in Garden City, I mean, we would compete with the states of like Texas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Colorado. You know, there was a lot of great fighters out there, but I mean, the mecca of boxing is in Southern California. Yeah. And uh, when I turned in my high school diploma, I mean, that was pretty much my ticket out. So I had the support from my parents, you know, the support from my uncle, Eli Melek, which he's still right next to me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it's, it's been a great journey. You know, like every journey, there's the good times, the bad times, and yeah. just the times that you just have to overcome. Now, you know, when, when you came to San Diego, quickly you linked up with Carlos Barrigan, you know, who you joined a long union with. Now, I asked Carlos for his fondest memory of your guys' time together. He said fight 19 for you. You remember that one? The opponent was Miguel Angel Huerta. And that was really the first time in your career that you faced some serious adversity as you got clipped with the left hook in the first round. Carlos says that when you came back to the corner, his advice to you was box and get your legs underneath you. But you did the exact opposite and you came out exchange hooks with them, drop them, ultimately stopping him in that second round. Now you're a disciplined fly fighter, but what propelled you to say to hell with it and go at Huerta? And what did you learn the most in that fight? Well, I mean, if you guys haven't seen the video, it's on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Miguel Angel Huerta versus Antonio Rosco. Um, yeah, you know, it's, I guess it was just, um, just myself being, you know, the, I mean, after getting, clip like that and it wasn't until after I watched the fight that I kind of, you know, I kind of wasn't, I was out on my legs, you know, yeah. and fighting back. Uh, but, you know, it, it was a, 
it was just one of those times where I kind of had to prove myself. You know, it was my first time facing, like you said, adversity with a, you know, a heavy-handed puncher like that. And, uh, you know, I'm not the one to shy away from a good exchange. And I mean, it, the tables turned, you know, I mean, it's, it was just, I, I still remember, you know, there's, there's a picture up here, right? Uh, but it, you know, it's, man, I, I don't know. I just can't answer your question with an exact answer, but I just had to do it. Was a little bit of coraje coming out of that, that first Yeah, one? pretty much, you know, it's like, he got me good, I gotta return the favor, yeah. so. Um, now, there's some debate amongst your most ardent of supporters. Some say your signature win was against Keandre Gibson. Some say it was the Humberto Soto fight. Uh, both very impressive victories, but I hear that your, your camp for the Gibson fight was among the best. Which would you consider your signature fight? You know, I, I would consider my signature fight when I actually fought, um, Oh man, Transformer. <laughs> That's what I Taylor, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. You know, he had just come off of a loss from fighting. Uh, come on, Broner, Adrian, Adrian Broner. Adrian Broner. Adrian Broner. Sorry, just had a bad one. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, this is a fight that I would see as kind of measuring on myself. You know, by that time I had already fought Soto. And, uh, you know, Soto's a very skilled fighter. You know, he's, uh, I mean, very crafty. And then with Gibson, you know, that was after coming back from an issue that I had with Wade. So, you know, with, with uh, Emmanuel Taylor, I mean, it was 10 rounds of like back and forth action. And uh, I mean, respect him, shout out to him, because he also helped me during the training camp yeah. <laughs> for <laughs> County Gibson. Yeah. So, you know, but I mean, all, all three fights, you know, it was uh, taking another step forward. So, I mean, without those guys, you know, it's, it's kind of developing my, my career. Yeah. Exactly. Now, speaking of the Soto fight, you know, recently he had success against your friend Brandon Rios, right? And uh, he had some more success in the early goings against Jesse Vargas. Now, you know, we talked about him, you know, you fought him in 2015. He's 39 years old with 82 bouts. Are you surprised that he's still fighting at such a high level? Well, I mean, he's, it looks like he's taking care of himself. <laughs> yeah. You know, he hasn't been through so many wars, you know, that you would say that he's uh, run down. I mean, I mean, yeah, he's, you know, getting older, but uh, I mean, being able to give fighters still a good fight, I mean, that, that should say something for him. And, you know, kind of the, the ironic thing was that when I was in training camp, well, Jesse was also there, so <laughs> we kind of, you know, sparred and stuff. So, but, but I mean, it, I was just getting my work done. But uh, yeah, when that fight was announced, I was, I was a little bit surprised. <laughs> yeah, he's still going, man, Zorita. Yeah, we're still doing it. Now, the question I have, okay, a lot of people don't know, but one weekend here in San Diego, yeah. getting ready for the Nationals, uh, you actually beat Jesse Vargas yeah. on a Sunday, and a well, good friend of ours, Javier Molina, who ended up fighting for the United States, representing the United States, one weekend. How was that? How was that? Now they're coming from Garden City and, and coming over here and doing that. Oh man, well, it's, it's like I said, you know, Southern California being a mega boxing. Yeah. <laughs> this is like when I was literally first introduced to the amateur style of boxing here. Yeah. And yeah. very different. You know, I mean, when I fought uh, Javier the first night, I mean, it was, I mean, he, was, he still is, you know, yeah. quick fighter, great fighter. Mm -hmm. And then fighting Jesse the, the following day, I mean, I didn't know who they were at the time, but then after <laughs> being told like, oh, well, you know, these guys are very, very good amateur fighters, yeah. you know, they're very well recognized. I mean, that, that kind of, you know, it, it, it gave me, you know, uh, just like, just like inspired me. And then just knowing that, hey, you know, I'm doing the right thing. Yep. You know, I'm at, I'm at the right place. And uh, I mean, from there on, like, it's just history. So, uh, Tony, uh, lastly, Throughout your career, you fought in the San Diego area here a total of seven times in your career. You're probably the most prominent fighter to come out of this area since Terry Norris. Um, do you see yourself fighting in San Diego one more time, time number eight? Oh, definitely, you know, I would, I would love to. Um, Frank Espinosa, Golden Boy. Welterweight debut here <laughs> in San Diego. Uh, no, definitely, you know, fighting at in San Diego, you know, fighting at home, it's always 
uh, I mean, I just like, I built roots here already. You know, I consider this my home pretty much, you know, yeah. after, you know, my, my last three kids being born here. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, it's, you know, this is where I started my professional career, you know, coming back home is, is always, I mean, it just brings so much pleasure to, you know, that, you know, the people that have been supporting you since day one, you know, are gonna be there for you. And uh, I mean, I would love it. Yeah. You know, I'm pretty sure you guys would. I know, that, of course. <laughs> I would definitely be here. Yeah. I mean, you did fight yeah. here before. Yeah. Delmar Del Fergus, right? Del Mar Fergus. Del Martino Norio. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Tough fight, you got cut. Yeah, but, but you ended up winning. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why they don't bring boxing back to yeah. San Diego more. I got excited with the Javante well, Davis We got cheesed fight. with the Abdomadis Javante uh, Exactly. <laughs> so hopefully, hey, Golden yeah. Boy, let's bring this guy back to San Diego. Let's put an event here. Let's go. Now, uh, let's talk about I want to bring up because look, a lot of people don't know you're a great family man. Love your family, yes. your kids. Talk about because a lot of people don't really see the inside of training camp. They kind of just see it from the outside, just when you fight, right? <laughs> how how are you able to juggle uh, being with the family and going to training camp and getting ready for a fight? Talk with us a little bit, a little bit about that. Well, you know, uh, for all those that don't know, I have four kids, so. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, now I have a handful. Yeah. Uh, it's it's very difficult, you know. Yeah. Uh, now that my kids are getting older, you know, they're participating in more activities, activities that you know I kind of have to miss. Mm. But I, you know, that's kind of the sacrifice of, of the sport. You know, they they understand. Um, it's not easy, you know. But um, I guess the the outcome is what makes up for it. And. Uh, I mean, if anything, I mean, my wife should be the one that getting a lot of props here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. of course. Uh, you know, everyone that, you know, when I mentioned that I've created Roots here in San Diego, you know, my wife has, like, a great support um, that comes from, you know, from church, from friends that we made, if, I mean, from my son's baseball, uh, baseball games, and, you know, it, it's just uh, the support that she has around herself kind of makes it a little bit easier for me to know that, you know, she has the help there that she's gonna need. But, I mean, being away from family, it's, it's never easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, you've, you've played, uh, played a big part in the development of many fighters here in the House of Boxing, this gym. Most recently, Kevin Torres. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself in boxing when, when your pro career is all over? Do you see yourself maybe as a trainer or helping out? Or, or what do you see yourself doing after, after your fighting days are over? You know, that's a, that's a really difficult question. Um, it's I've been doing this since the age of 10 you know it's, uh, once my career I guess you could say would be over uh, you know family is a very important thing to me and I would say you know I would have to put my family first see in what place I'm at and then decide from there you know whether I become a trainer or go open a gym um, because as you know, David, you know, having a boxing gym is no easy thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of possibilities out there, you know. Um, I mean, shoot, go back to school, do something. I mean, there's, there's never, uh, it's never too late. Exactly. Uh, so now, let's go into, I want to talk a little bit about some guys that you've sparred here. You have sparred. So you just talking about sparring Kevin Torres. You have sparred Josecito. Talk with us a little about that. We just mentioned as an yeah, possible, possible opponent. Possible percent. opponent. Uh, I mean, talk about some of the guys that you sparred with, uh, some of the camps you've been in that have been able to help you and mold you into the fighter you are today. Well, um, you know, when we talk about Josecito Lopez, I mean, the guy's a, he's a warrior. Yeah. You, know, you got to give it to him. Uh, regardless of the, of the fight he's in, you know, he makes it exciting. And I mean, it's, you know, when I was in training camp with them, you know, those were like, like I said, you know, like with every training camp, we try to get better and better. And without a doubt, that's, you know, one of the training camps that I got like a lot of work from. You know, he's a very active fighter, very busy. And uh, just this last training camp, you know, sparring with uh, Jesse Vargas, for one, um, being in there with a fellow teammate of mine, Raul Curiel, you know, also an up and coming, Prospect. Uh, I mean, who else has sparred here? I mean, there's Sorita, <laughs> Sorita Soto, right? Soto, you you've been know, able to spar I've him, I've been right? sparring with Soto. I, you know, I was ever sparring with uh, Antonio DeMarco at one point, you know, yeah, when yeah. I was coming up. Um, Tim Bradley. Timothy Bradley. Timothy Bradley. I helped Timothy Bradley when he was getting ready for Marquez. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, It'd be a precursor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've had those opportunities with, with a lot of great fighters. I mean, I think one of the guys I will never forget was uh, Titere. Oh, you know, very yeah, awkward first, fighter. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> not the yeah. Very, and, but I mean, you know, those, those are... The world champion, yeah. Like you said, you know, sparrings and fighters that help mold you. Yeah. And, uh, no, I mean, yeah. I've had my fair shares in, out there, yeah. and so... Uh, yeah. Well, my friend, you, you passed the interrogation, man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we we want to thank you for, for breaking, breaking news here, guys, on HOB TV. Exactly. We want to thank our guest. Yeah, so thank our guest, Antonio Orozco. If, uh, go ahead and tell them, where, if those people that are watching and want to stay connected with them, where can they follow you on Instagram uh, so they can stay connected with your next possible fight day? Yeah, so uh, my Instagram is at It's Relentless, I-T-S, Relentless. Yeah. Um, and then Facebook, it's Relentless Antonio Orozco. Twitter, it's at Puro Vox Orozco. Um, you know, they're all linked together, so it should be no problem following me <laughs> or finding me. Exactly. Again, Orozco, thank you uh, so much for coming on in, man, and being part of the show. Uh, make sure you guys tune in next week for next week's show. And like we mentioned in the early at the beginning of the show, make sure you guys click subscribe. And if you guys want to leave a comment, possible opponents for Orozco, go ahead and leave a comment. Uh, for possible opponents that you would like to see him fight. Uh, thank you guys for tuning on in. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks, guys.